webinar panel or email us directly. If you submit questions through GoToWebinar, we'll receive a report with your question and contact information to follow up directly after the webinar. If you're interested in receiving a PDF, please contact us. We encourage you to share the reporting within your network. And at this time, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Darren Stutt. Darren has worked for Keras for over 24 years with the last year in the Technical Solutions Group. Darren conducts laboratory testing and product demonstrations for Keras's municipal, industrial, and environmental customers and prospective new customers. These product demonstrations include technical trainings, safety presentations, and the installation of safe chemical handling and dosing systems. He is a graduate from Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry, ACS certified. Mr. Scott is a member of AWWA, WEF, and the American Chemical Society. Thanks, Ashley. To begin with, I want you to know that Keras LLC is a member of the American Chemistry Council, ACC, and as a member, we participate in ACC's Responsible Care Initiative. The ACC provides broad guidance aiming toward no accidents, no injuries, and no harm to the environment. There are several important principles that form the program, but none more important than to protect the safety of our workplace staff and our customers. Today's program is one part of our ongoing customer safety communication efforts. Keras has a wide variety of permanganate products, and this includes Kerox potassium permanganate and Kerosol sodium permanganate, along with other market-specific products. Additional information is available for each individual product, so please feel free to contact us if you'd like to learn more about a specific product. Because we want every employee to arrive safely at work each morning and return home safely each evening, we emphasize understanding and practicing chemical safety. Our annual company goal is zero recordable incidents. We want the same for your workplace. Training webinars, such as this one, are a part of our product safety communications program, and our goal is to continue to upgrade and improve the information and the way that we communicate with you. The first item that we would like to talk to you about today is the January 11th fire at our manufacturing facility. Following a comprehensive review, Keras has determined that the root cause of the LaSalle manufacturing facility fire on January 11, 2023, was a combination of events stemming from damaged packaging of Kerox potassium permanganate. Understanding what happened that day is important for the entire community, and we are committed to mitigating the risk of this ever happening again. We recognize the effect this has had on our neighbors, friends, and family, and our priority continues to be the safety of our employees and residents of the greater LaSalle Peru community and our customers around the world. The combination of events that led to the fire were Kerox potassium permanganate, which was contained in super sac packaging, a common form of packaging that we use, was being transported from the warehouse to a waiting truck and was damaged in transit transit by a forklift truck. Following normal protocols, the warehouse team cleaned up the spilled material and moved the damaged super sack to a separate location. As the damaged super sack was being moved, friction caused by the forklift moving the support pallet likely ignited the material underneath the pallet. In the more than 100 years Keras has been in business, there has never been an event like this. Keras is committed to mitigating the risk that there could be a repeat of this event through careful adherence to established safe handling and storage practices, as well as all local, state, and federal regulations. We ask our customers to do the same. Keras will continue to provide updates on cleanup and community support efforts on our website. Some of the lessons learned from this, if you have a spill, immediately stop what you are doing, isolate personnel, and properly clean up the spill. Avoid creating friction with combustible materials and oxidizers. Do not push, drag, etc., moving a pallet across the floor. Do not become complacent with things that you work with on a daily basis. And hazard recognition must be completed for daily activities. These are all ways we've learned to prevent this in the future. Now let's start by reviewing some chemistry. 
First, a reminder today, we are focusing on Keras permanganate products. Permanganates are part of a chemical category identified as oxidizing agents. Oxidizing agents are a form of energized oxygen and they are useful in synthesis and purification chemistries. Permanganates are also a manganese chemical. The element manganese, MN, is found in the periodic table next to iron in the first row of transition metals and is present in each permanganate product. The properties of oxidizing agents and manganese compounds drive the regulations that govern permanganate safe storage, transport, handling, and disposal. Permanganate products are manufactured, packaged, and delivered in one of two common forms. Crystalline solids, which are typically going to be potassium permanganate, which are greater than 97% active, and concentrated liquids, typically 20% and 40% as sodium permanganate. The hazard potential of permanganates is sometimes difficult to understand, and it's really based on the concentration. Here is a visual aid to help explain this idea. The graph is divided into three zones. Green is low risk, yellow is moderate risk, and salmon red is high risk. Here's what this diagram represents. The hazard potential for permanganate product increases with increasing concentration. When permanganate is dissolved in water to less than about 6% by weight, the risk is in the green zone where most hazards are insignificant. Actually, our recommendation for most customers working with potassium permanganate is a range of one to 4% solution strength. Because it's limited to 6% at less than room temperature, that's why the recommendation for one to four. Notice that the liquid permanganates are manufactured and packaged at a much higher concentration than 6%, typically 20% and 40%. They're represented by the red triangles on the graph. This moves them up the graph into the yellow cautious zone. They are aggressive in this range. Finally, as you might expect, the dry crystalline potassium permanganate, which is manufactured as greater than 97% purity, has the greatest potential for hazardous reactions when mixed with incompatible materials. In this form, it can initiate fires when in contact with incompatible materials. The first step of worker safety is knowing the risks. What can hurt you and how it can happen? There are three situations that really define the potential hazards of permanganate use. First, the oxidizer hazard. Unanticipated reactions with incompatible materials. This situation is potentially hazardous when concentrated permanganate products are mixed together with substances that they can chemically react with. Because the permanganate is concentrated, a mixture such as this will generally generate heat and release heat. Note, permanganate does not react with all substances only a select group of reactive materials. Second, aquatic hazard. Environmental hazards may occur because a large reuse may adversely affect aquatic life, or if improperly disposed of, can result in a situation like the oxidizer hazard. Finally, there is a health hazard. Regarding human safety, exposure to permanganate be, may be internal by ingestion or inhalation or external, such as skin, eye, or clothing exposure when handling it or due to spills or splashing. Most of the health effect hazards are associated with exposure to manganese dust every day and are considered chronic long-term exposure, such as our factory workers. For most users, short-term exposure issues are more important when sensitive tissues, such as the eyes, may be exposed and result in injury. Worker personal protective equipment is always required when handling for manganese. So how do we get the word out to you as our customers? Communicating the potential hazards and precautionary actions, specific worker protections, and remediation options is accomplished through a variety of methods. In addition to seminars such as this one, the common routes are shown here. They would include safety data sheets, chemical safety reports for Europe reach, package labels, pictograms, and warning placards. As our understanding of product applications evolve and as regulations change, these communication routes may also be reformatted or revised. 
This brings us to the most significant change in the last few years, to the globally harmonized system for hazard communication, GHS. Today, there is a drive for consistency in the way information is delivered worldwide. Our presentation is in part designed to inform you of the changes that have impacted permanganate product safety communication. The safety data sheet, SDS, is still our most important safety literature piece. As of June of 2015, the GHS compliance safety data sheet replaces the previous material safety data sheet, MSDS. This is a switch to a new name that signals there have been changes. For example, there is now a standard 16 section format. Also globally standardized red, black, and white pictograms are part of this format. A safety data sheet is available for crystalline potassium permanganate, and all of the cautionary information relates to the dry material, which is nearly 100% active ingredient. When it is stored and handled properly, it is stable and easy to use, but it is an oxidizer, and if the dry powder is mixed with incompatible materials, it will generate heat. Some of those incompatible materials include acids, peroxides, combustible materials, organics, metal powders, oils, and grease. However, when permanganate is mixed with water as a dilute solution, most of those acute hazards are eliminated. As I mentioned earlier, potassium permanganate hazards are self-limiting because at room temperature, the strongest water solution you can make is 6% by weight. Water is your friend when working with permanganate. The SDS for Kerox potassium permanganate was updated in November of 2021. Here are the health hazard pictograms that are required for crystalline potassium permanganate products. These pictograms apply to all package size. The health and safety categories are also new and they are based on the latest research data. There are four categories in the toxicity rating system with category one representing the greatest hazard and category four being the lowest hazard class. There is a separate rating system for corrosivity and irritation potential. In the case of corrosivity, there is only a category one, but with A, B, and C subcategories. For permanganate, the health hazards are listed as acute toxicity oral, category four, skin corrosion slash irritation, category one C, serious eye damage irritation, category one, the highest, reproductive toxicity, unborn child, category two, Specific target organ toxicity, repeated exposure, category two. If you'd like more detail about the category definitions, the OSHA.gov website listed will provide all the appropriate tables for additional information. In addition to the new pictograms, permanganate label requirements include the following. Name, address, and telephone of the company, a product identifier, signal words, hazard statements, precautionary statements, and any supplementary information. They are designed to better define the health and safety impacts of the product being used on the label itself. If signal words are required, there are only two to choose from, warning or danger, with danger being the higher rating. The signal word for permanganate that you can see on the label there is danger, so the highest category along with all the pictograms. Precautionary statements. This is the precautionary statements for permanganate. The wording is specific to permanganate and linked to the physical hazards associated with oxidants and specifically permanganate. Prevention. Obtain special instructions before use. Do not handle until all safety precautions have been read and understood. Keep away from heat. Take any precaution to avoid mixing with combustibles. Keep store away from clothing, combustible materials. Do not breathe dust, fumes, gases, mist, vapor, or sprays. Wear protective gloves, protective clothing, eye protection, face protection. Do not eat, drink, or smoke when using this product. Wash thoroughly after handling. Avoid releases to the environment. 
In case of a response for a fire, use appropriate media for extinction. If swallowed, rinse mouth, do not induce vomiting. Immediately call a poison center doctor. If on skin or hair, take off all contaminated clothing, rinse skin with water or use a safety shower, wash contaminated clothing before reuse. If it is in eyes, rinse cautiously with water for several minutes. Remove your contact lenses if present and easy to do. Continue rinsing, and if inhaled, remove person to fresh air and keep comfortable for breathing. For storage, store locked up. Disposal, dispose of contents container in accordance with local, regional, national, and international regulations. This is the hazard statement for permanganate. It reflects the potential health hazards as well as the oxidizing chemistry of permanganate. May intensify fire, oxidizer, harmful if swallowed, causes severe skin burns and eye damage, suspected of damaging the unborn child, may cause damage to organs through prolonged use or repeated exposure. Environmental hazards. This is a new pictogram. Because permanganate's environmental impact is related to the quantity of material that may be released, this pictogram only applies to large packages. Hazardous to aquatic environment, acute hazard, category one. Hazardous to the aquatic environment, long-term hazard, category one as well. Lastly, this is the GHS pictogram that reflects the oxidizing nature of permanganates. The physical hazard criteria are available if you would like more detail. Permanganate falls under oxidizing solids, category two, crystalline permanganate. Many people are familiar with the oxidizer symbol of the burning circle and is something that's been very familiar as it's been in use with permanganate over time. A safety data sheet is also available for permanganate liquids and all of the cautionary information relates to the concentrated product as it's delivered. As with dry permanganate, when concentrated liquids between 20 and 40% are stored and handled properly, they are stable and easy to use. In the case of the liquid products, we often receive questions about the potential for releasing gases. There are no vapors that are released from permanganate solutions. These packages do not require venting. Concentrated liquid permanganate is an oxidizer, and if it's mixed with incompatible materials, it will generate heat. However, when it is dissolved in water as a dilute solution, no, most immediate hazards are eliminated. Just like with potassium permanganate, water is your friend when working with permanganate. One additional safety piece with liquid permanganate, because of the higher concentration of 20 and 40%, if you were to wipe up a spill with a rag or a paper towel, that can eventually ignite and so you want to dilute to less than 6% and neutralize prior to throwing the rag or paper towel that wiped up the liquid permanganate spill. Health hazards. Liquid permanganate also has health hazard pictograms. These pictograms apply to all package sizes. The health and safety categories are also new and they're based on the latest research data. Acute sec toxicity, oral, category four, Skin corrosion irritation, category 1B. Serious eye damage irritation, category one. And specific target organ toxicity, single exposure, respiratory tract irritation, category three. Additional information is on the OSHA.gov website listed below. So before I start with more technical safety information, I thought I would first offer some new information about personal protective equipment. In the US, hundreds of thousands of preventable eye injuries occur every year. When you're working with permanganate products, eye protection should always be your highest priority. When handling, scooping, or pouring potassium permanganate dry crystals, you will typically encounter dust. The sodium permanganate liquids may also be hazardous if you are pouring or pumping the product. Our recommendations at Keras are typically goggles and or face shields, depending on your exposure. The eyes are very sensitive tissue and must be 
protected from permanganate dust particles and liquid droplets. Dry permanganate crystals are sharp and abrasive and can scratch the eye surface. Plus, the crystals contain a small amount of alkali from the manufacturing progress, or the permanganate may react with eye tissue forming alkaline products. This alkali could produce a corrosive burn to the eye. For those reasons, eye protection is very important. Our most re recent recommendation is to use goggles when handling concentrated liquid permanganates or when exposure to dust would be high. You want to ensure that you have an eye wash station nearby as well when handling product. At our manufacturing facility, we are changing our eye protection equipment. We now use fully sealed safety glasses that have a gasket material around the outside that fits tightly to the face. There are many styles of these glasses and you should find the one that has the best proper fit for your face. These glasses also have anti-fogging and prescription lenses available for them. These glasses are not a replacement for goggles when handling concentrated liquids or exposure to dust is high. Before handling permanganate, always review the possible hazards and choose the right eye protection for the type of work that you are doing. The inhalation exposure scenarios for permanganate products, for the most part, apply only to the dry crystalline products. When transferring the material from its package into a storage hopper, a fine dust can be released. This caution also applies to any situation where permanganate is air conveyed to a storage silo. Permanganate dust is an irritant and breathing it should be avoided. Permanganate is a manganese compound and inhalation exposure is based on the manganese ceiling value of five milligrams manganese per cubic meter of air and a time weighted average of 0.1 milligrams of manganese per cubic meter of air. It may be possible, however, to imagine a situation where a fine mist of liquid permanganate is generated and a worker may be exposed. This would be rare, but could occur if the concentrated liquids are being sprayed applied to an application or if a line under pressure has a small cutter leak. Our recommendation is to use the appropriate NIOSH MASHS approved dust or mist respirator. At our CARES facility, we use N95 masks, which many people are now familiar with. Also, if you're gonna be handling a lot of permanganate, the facility must implement a respiratory program to comply with OSHA if concentrations exceed the permissible levels that I listed before. It is the customer's duty to determine the risk of dust mist in its application and to protect their workers against that risk. One thing to keep in mind, solutions of potassium permanganate and sodium permanganate, there is no vapor or gas release from those solution tanks. Permanganate will react with skin oils producing brown stains. Highly concentrated liquid permanganate may attack the skin or other contamination on the skin. Gloves should be worn when handling permanganates. We use chemical resistant PVC or Teflon coated gloves in our facilities. Cotton gloves should not be worn. Nitrile lab gloves are also commonly used if you need more finger dexterity when working with small fittings. If the level of exposure could be significant, like the delivery of bulk liquid permanganate, then an apron should be worn to limit exposure in case of a leak. Keep in mind, if you get permanganate on yourself, it will leave brown stains behind. In addition to your normal work clothing, pick the proper PPE of gloves and apron as required. As with all chemicals, concentrated permanganate products should not be ingested. Always wash hands before eating, drinking, or smoking. If permanganate is swallowed, it can cause severe burns to the mouth, throat, esophagus, and stomach. If ingestion of permanganate occurs, immediately rinse the mouth and drink plenty of water. Never give anything by mouth to a victim who is unconscious or who is having convulsions. Do not induce in vomiting. If vomiting occurs, keep head low so that the stomach content doesn't get into the lungs. Get immediate medical attention. Refer to section four of the SDS for more information.
I now want to discuss how to properly store concentrated permanganate products and the potential hazardous conditions that you should be aware of. Permanganate products are manufactured and packaged in containers made of compatible materials. When permanganate is repackaged into smaller container sizes, the proper container materials must be used. Under normal conditions, permanganates are very stable and have a shelf life of many years. Cautionary statements regarding proper storage reflect the concerns of accidental leakage or spills from the original packaging, mixing with incompatible materials on the warehouse floor or drainage system. In a warehouse, be aware that lift truck forks may puncture permanganate packaging. Permanganate that leaks from a damaged container can react with lift truck brake fluids or antifreeze on the floor or the decking of a trailer. You do want to keep permanganate separated from heat sources, organic chemicals, and concentrated acids. In the case of permanganate with concentrated permanganate with hydrochloric acid, this will release chlorine gas as a byproduct. So do not allow permanganate and concentrated hydrochloric acid to mix. Permanganate can also react with sulfuric acid, forming manganese heptoxide. You also don't want to have this reaction. One of the good things is that when you have a spill, clean it up immediately. Refer to section seven of the SDS for additional information on handling and storage. On another note related to product safety, we receive many questions about equipment, pipes, gaskets, and tank materials that can be used when storing and feeding permanganate products. We have prepared guidelines and suggestions for compatible materials for each permanganate product. These guidelines are based on our experiences in our manufacturing facility, from published references by materials and equipment suppliers, from lab tests that we have conducted, and most importantly, from customers' experiences in the field. New materials are always being developed, and if we are not familiar with them at Keras, we can run simple tests to determine short-term acceptability of those materials. One word of caution, common materials can be sourced from many different manufacturers and they can be produced in many different grades. A particular product may work well in one case, but poorly in another, depending on the manufacturer or the grade of product that's being used. Please reach out to us and we will be pleased to share our experiences with different materials and how they react with permanganate products and provide you the material compatibility sheet for the product that you are using. Permanganate also falls under the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standard, CFATS. Under the CFATS program, the Department of Homeland Security has identified over 300 chemicals of interest that could possibly be used by terrorists to produce a dangerous reaction. Potassium permanganate, along with several other oxidizing agents, are included on this list. The CFAT standard limits the quantity of permanganate that can be stored at an industrial site where there is inadequate security in place. The maximum quantity is 400 pounds, Following a top screening where proper security measures have been verified, inventorying large quantities may be permitted. One thing to keep in mind is municipalities are exempt from this standard. Our authorized distributors comply with this standard by installing property fences, secure gates, and surveillance com cameras at their site. For additional information on this standard, you can go to the dhs.gov website listed below. Keep in mind, CFATS only applies to potassium permanganate at this time. Sodium permanganate is not currently covered under the CFATS regulation. Permanganates are normally very stable. They are also not flammable. However, when an oxidizing agent such as permanganate is involved in a fire, or if they are exposed to a heat source, they may decompose. This decomposition releases oxygen, which will help to sustain and accelerate the fire. Fires involving permanganate cannot be extinguished by smothering them with inert foams. Only water is effective. Crystalline permanganate decomposition starts at 302 degrees Fahrenheit, where it will give off oxygen. 
and liquid permanganate products start at 275 degrees where they'll give off oxygen. You can see the reaction above. The NFP hazard code is used to communicate valuable information to first responders regarding health hazards, fire hazards, reactivity hazards, and special identifiers for the products. The numbers range from zero, little hazard, to four, the highest hazard. If chemicals are involved in a fire, it signals how the products may react, what the effects of the byproduct formation are, and how the chemicals might react with water used to extinguish a fire. You can see more information about each of the numbers uh, in the pictogram to the side. The NFPA hazard code for potassium permanganate and sodium permanganate is shown here. Of special note, the NFPA half hazard code, the blue quadrant, has been revised for permanganate and has been revised to a category of three. This reflects the irritating byproducts that may be formed during a fire. The flammability hazard for permanganate is zero. It's considered non-flammable. It does not burn, but it will support combustion. The reactivity hazard is new as well. It's considered a one instead of a zero in the past. It's normally stable. It does not react with water, but it will react with things in the water. So if you have certain compounds that react with permanganate in the water, that's where the reactivity comes from. And then you'll always see the special hazard OX, which is the standard symbol for oxidizers. Remember, you cannot smother a fire involving permanganate because oxygen is liber liberated from the reaction. If a fire occurs and permanganate is involved, large quantities of water must be used as the extinguishing medium. You want to burn to contain the water so the permanganate does not get off your plant site. Once again, I want to stress, do not use dry chemical extinguishers such as CO2, halon, or foams only use large quantities of water to extinguish fires related to permanganate. Refer to section five of the SDS for more information. Product spills can and do occur as evidenced by the facility incident we had earlier this year. If dry permanganate is spilled, sweep up the material and transfer it to a clean metal drum immediately. Do not return the spilled product to the original package. If that container still contains permanganate, floor sweepings could include reactive material that will contaminate or react with the permanganate in the drum. Keep in mind, you don't know what was on the floor before a spill, so you wanna make sure that you separate the permanganate that was on the floor um, into a different container. Containment can include patching. At our facility, we use tie patch, a plastic containment pallet, an overpack. Do not use cardboard, chipboard, or other combustible materials when containing permanganate. Refer to section 13 of the SDS for additional information. Dilute permanganate solution spill cleanup. The first step you wanna take is to contain and isolate the liquid, containing it in a pit or a holding area behind a berm. You wanna first dilute the solution with water until the permanganate concentration is less than 6%. Once you're below 6%, you can neutralize the permanganate solution using sodium thiosulfite, bisulfite, or a ferrous salt. Additional information is in section 13 of the SDS. Following materials have been tested and found to be compatible with our liquid permanganate. At our facility, we use pig hazmat absorbent socks, spill tech absorbent pads, and United Zorbents polypropylene absorbent pads to clean up leaks of permanganate. Additional safety considerations. In the case of concentrated permanganate, in the case of 20 or 40% sodium, water is your best friend. Never neutralize a concentrated solution 
or concentrated dry material. You always want to either sweep up the dry material and put it in overpack or dilute the concentrated 20 or 40 percent to less than 6 percent before attempting any type of chemical neutralization. One additional consideration with 20 and 40 percent sodium permanganate, do not wipe up spills, clean up drips or leaks, or wipe down equipment with a dry rag or paper toweling. Have buckets of water available and wet the rag with water. Wipe up the spill. After using the, the rag, the wet rag or wet paper toweling, rinse it in water until there's no pink or purple color left, and then dispose of properly. One thing that you always want to keep in mind with liquid permanganate, it may not immediately ignite in the case of 20 or 40 percent when you wipe up a spill with a dry rag or paper toweling, but when you throw it in the trash, it could do that minutes later. So you always want to make sure there's no leftover permanganate in the rag or paper toweling. Permanganate diluted with water to make a, a weaker solution below 6% can be neutralized by reducing it with many commonly available dechlorinating or reducing agents. When the permanganate is gone, there is no purple or pink color visible and the remaining solution is non-hazardous. It can be disposed of following local regulations. Neutralizing solutions can also be used to remove brown permanganate stains from floors or equipment that have come in contact with permanganate. The reaction will change from purple permanganate color to brown and then to clear as the reaction proceeds, as you see in the picture of a permanganate spill on concrete. You don't see any purple, you see the brown manganese dioxide, and then as the solution is applied, you can see where it's clear as well on the concrete. Some of the most commonly available materials used to neutralize permanganate are sodium thiosulfate and sodium bisulfate, which are also common dechlorinating agents used in drinking water and wastewater facilities around the US. One of the most common occurrences with permanganate is brown stains on your hands or equipment and they can be removed by preparing a fresh solution. This cleaning solution that we recommend is one third part water, one third white household vinegar, and one third part 3% hydrogen peroxide that you would buy at the local grocery store. Keep in mind, this is 3% hydrogen peroxide. In industrial applications, you might have 10, 15, or 25% hydrogen peroxide, and you'll want to dilute that down to 3% or less when making this solution. Never use this solution on sensitive tissues. So don't spray it in your eyes, mucous membranes, any open wounds or burns. You also don't wanna use this and add it directly to concentrated permanganate solutions. Always dilute the permanganate solution to less than 6% with water before using the stain removal solution, or better yet, completely wash any permanganate off your hands to where you can't see any pink or purple color and then use this neutralizing solution to remove the brown to black stain that's on your hands. If you are transporting or shipping permanganate products, US Department of Transportation hazardous material regulations are in effect. When shipping permanganate, the proper package, labels, placards, and documents must be used. Those would include identifying and classifying the hazardous material to be transported, establishing the quantity limitations for the product, specifying the proper packaging for the product, describes how to mark and label the package, defines what would be on the shipping certificates the driver would have, and then also details on how to placard the vehicle transporting the shipment of product. Under the Department of Transportation, the US DOT still requires that the yellow diamond oxidizer label and placard be used on packages and over the road shipments of permanganate. This requirement does vary depending on the size of the package. The shipping documents the driver has must show the proper shipping name, the UN number, and any reportable quantity. For dry crystalline potassium permanganate, the ID number is UN 1490, 
and the reportable quantity is 100. It falls under hazard class oxidizer and packing group two. For liquid permanganates, including both potassium permanganate and sodium permanganate solutions, the ID number now changes to UN3214. There is no established reportable quantity. The hazard class is still an oxidizer and it is still packing group two. There are currently two US acts that regulate the release of or disposal of permanganates into the environment. The first act is RECRA, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. It establishes four characteristics of a hazardous waste. It can be either ignitability, corrosivity, reactivity, or EP toxicity. It identifies oxidizers like permanganate as hazardous under the ignitable waste characteristics and actually lists potassium permanganate by name. The other act that governs permanganate release to the environment is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, also referred to as the Superfund Regulation. A crystalline or liquid permanganate released to the environment must be reported if it exceeds the reportable quantity for that product. Under CERCLA, dry potassium permanganate has a reportable quantity of 100 pounds. Liquid sodium permanganate does not have a reportable quantity for sodium permanganate-based products. If you have a release to the environment that is above the reportable quantity, you must call the National Response Center or list it. Remember, a release to the environment must be over the reportable quantity and must be outside the fence line of your facility. We get asked this question many times at Keras, and if you spill product inside your fence line, right next to your feeder, right next to your application point, as long as it's contained within your facility, within your fence line, that is not a reportable quantity. It has to be outside your fence line and released into the environment. So if you were transporting product, like in shipping from one facility to another and had an accident by the side of the road and released to the environment, that would report would be a rep, and it was above the reportable quantity that would have to be reported or if you had a leak on your plant facility site and the leak went through your fence line to the outside environment that would also be a reportable quantity just keep in mind it has to be a release to the environment and above the reportable quantity in order for you to report it to the national response center Disposal of the product in containers. Permanganate is considered for disposal as a D1 ignitable waste. So if you're going to dispose of permanganate, it should be completed through a licensed disposal companies. Packaging must be triple rinsed to an absence of pink color and the label removed prior to proper recycling or disposal. You can refer to section 13 of the SDS for a diff different additional information. One of the questions we get asked all the time at Keras is how do you dispose of empty containers and can they be recycled? The permanganate that is shipped from our facility and containers are designated as single use and they cannot be returned or refilled in our standard packaging unless it's a cycle bin. When a container has been emptied, there are companies that will collect them and recycle the plastic or the metal. In the case of permanganate products, Empty really does mean empty and triple rinsed with water. The recycling slash disposal company cannot accept any residual permanganate in the container. One of the things to keep in mind, triple rinsing is really the goal here so that you see no pink or purple color when you're finished rinsing the container. You should select the site at your facility where the containers can be rinsed and the waste collected prior to you recycling them. Finally, customers should audit their safety and handling procedures for permanganate at their facility to ensure that they are up to date with the current regulations. For SDS and any other technical information provided in this presentation, please contact your regional account manager or a te technical solutions team member. You can also request this information via our website listed below.
My contact info along with product stewardship contact info is shown here as well as our general sales and marketing contact info. Now I'll hand it back to Ashley for some questions. Hey Sarah, we did have a few questions come in. The first one is how long can 20% sodium permanganate be stored in totes at ambient temperatures and still retain the original concentration? So sodium permanganate uh, does not lose strength over time. So it's a common question that we get asked. Uh, customers are used to peroxide or, or sodium hypochlorite, which lose strength over time. So we typically recommend that customers can store liquid permanganate for a year and it won't lose any concentration. It'll still be 20% or 40% concentration, just like the day you got it, uh, if stored at ambient temperatures. Okay, and does 20% sodium permanganate have a distinctive odor by itself? So some people will claim that they can smell metallic. I have had many customers say there's no smell. Uh, the only fumes or vapors that come off a total liquid permanganate are water vapors. So typically you shouldn't be able to smell anything but I have had people in the past tell me that they can smell a metallic smell. Um, but yeah. Okay, um, the next one that has come in, what is the shelf life of permanganate solutions and do they lose strength over time? So same question that we just answered. Um, the 20 and 40% are stable. Um, over the course of a year, they're not gonna lose concentration. So you can bring in multiple totes or multiple containers at one time and then use them over the course of the year. Uh, customers that buy bulk from us, we typically recommend that they try to use a bulk tank within one year, uh, just so they got turnover of the product in their tank. In the case of dry potassium permanganate, uh, that is stable in the container indefinitely. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you make dry permanganate into solution, most customers typically use drinking water uh, from their facility or drinking water that they have at, at their industrial facility. There are still some contaminants left in drinking water, uh, even after it's been cleaned up to drinking water standards. So if you do make a potassium permanganate solution with drinking water, you will see some reaction over time. Once those reactions complete, then the permanganate solution is stable. But do keep in mind that if you are using uh, drinking water quality, you might see some solids build up over the course of six months or a year in the solution tank. We do have some customers as well that use raw water at their facility. Uh, from a river or lake to make permanganate solutions and that will generate more solids in the tank and you'll have to clean it up more frequently so that you don't plug up those metering lines or those pumps at the facility. Okay and what is the lowest concentration that would be effective for deodorizing steel tanks given no time restraints? So if you're talking about cleaning up a tank um, like at a refinery or a wastewater facility um, most of our customers will make it down into a weaker solution to do recirculation. So a lot of times they'll make a 3% to 5% solution and then recirculate that through the tank during a refinery turnaround. That'll take care of mercaptan compounds, hydrogen sulfide compounds. And one of the things they do is because they make the weaker solution, you don't have to worry as much about the heater reaction because you're 97% water in that case. And then they can use the color change as well to know if they need to add more permanganate to the tank. As permanganate goes away, the pink to purple color goes away. So if you do a rinse and the water comes out and it's all brown, there's no pink or purple color, you know you probably haven't gotten all the contamination. So you do another rinse with permanganate solution at that you know, one to 3% solution strength again. If that now comes back with pink or purple color, you know you reacted with everything in the tank at that point. Okay, thanks, Darren. Um, the next one that has come in, what might happen if 20% sodium permanganate comes into contact with um, A, moss or algae and a rubber hose? So those are good questions. Uh, the first one's the easy one. So most natural rubber hoses are very reactive to permanganate. So you'll wanna pick a material from one of our material compatibility lists uh, that's compatible with permanganate. Uh, a lot of the ones at Home Depot, Menards, or your local hardware store, um, they'll be labeled right what's on them. A lot of times they'll say natural rubber. Natural rubber with 20% permanganate, it's going to attack it within days and it'll and it'll leak uh, and be just and be destroyed. What was the other part of that? Um, algae. In the case of moss or algae, permanganate is not a registered algicide, but permanganate does react with those. Uh, 
ingredient. So you will see an increased demand. So if there's algae in the water and you apply permanganate, it will consume as it does react with the algae. It's just not a registered algicide. Are EPDM Bison compatible with permanganate? So one of the most common questions we get asked at Keras is materials compatibility. We have a specific sheet for both potassium permanganate and for liquid permanganate, sodium permanganate, and it's based on concentration. EPDM and Viton are two very common materials that are used for gaskets and O-rings on materials. They are both compatible with potassium permanganate solutions because of the less than 6%. What we have found out at Keras is that 20 and 40% concentrations of sodium permanganate can attack EPDM and Viton O-rings, gaskets, and so there's better material that you can use. Typically, we suggest things like Teflon or silicone um, or other materials like Aflas that are better for being in contact with the 20% and 40% concentrated solutions. Um, another one that has come in, will the 20% sodium permanganate solution start a fire if it comes in contact with a one gallon pool of ethyl mercaptan or ethanol? So at, you're at, talking about a higher concentration. So 20% sodium permanganate increases the hazard like you can remember in that original pictogram. So it's not as the dilute solution. Um, in that case, um, it's going to depend on how much ethyl mercaptan there. There is a direct reaction between those two compounds, um, depending on the concentration of both. So you're already a little bit higher at 20% sodium permanganate. If the ethyl mercaptan concentration is at a much higher concentration, say 20%, you will generate heat of reaction. Based on there being water there, that's going to warm the temperature water up, but it also depends on what else is in the tank that can have that reaction. So. I would dilute before you do that. Okay, perfect. It looks like those are all the questions that have come in this far. If anyone does have additional questions, feel free um, to reach out. The e Karen's email is on the screen there. And so is our general sales and marketing email address. Thank you everyone for joining today and have a great rest of your day.